Thank you, sir, for making time for us on KTN News. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the National Treasury. Asante sana. Thank you. It's a tough time to be in government, especially the docket that you lead, the Ministry of Treasury and Planning. The country is still feeling the effects of the partial lockdown that was necessitated by the government, trying to ensure that there are containment measures towards in, uh, making it clear that the disease does not continue spreading. By all this, it's a question of flattening the curve. From where you sit, when you look at the numbers, how hard has the, have the measures hit the economy so far? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> as you said, everything happened for a reason. Mm -hmm. And we are here, and uh, in one of the core responsibility as a patriotic Kenyan, wherever we are, we have to do our best. We have to give the best. And we have to put the, the interest of the Kenyan population at the core of our day-to-day -day operation. Yes. I just wanted to take you through the journey for the period I've been here, generally in Treasury or generally, you know, with our teams. Yes. We realized even before the onset of COVID that uh, we had to tweak and do our business differently mm -hmm. because we had embarked on a fiscal consideration exercise mm -hmm. that will now restore dignity in our own management of the fiscal space. Yes. Meaning that as a, as a country, the solution to our economy will be dependent on us making sure that we grow our own revenue, manage public expenditure, and borrow only when it's absolutely unavoidable. Because mm -hmm. that means now and also in the future, we'll have secured the lives and the livelihood and the dignity of this country. Mm -hmm. So from July this year, sometimes before the onset of COVID, we had made a projections to start on a fiscal consolidation exercise to reduce the size of our budget deficit over a period of time. Sure. We were giving ourselves up to 2024 20, that we will have reduced the, our budget deficit to below 3% mm -hmm. of GDP. Mm -hmm. from about 8% to below 3%. Yes. What that means, then we'll have a lot of discretion to borrow concessionally and manage you know, our, day, our operations. We also need to realize that uh, some of the public good that the Jubilee administration has put in place, they are very positive. But the returns take time. Mm -hmm. Like the SGR and the major roads, uh, the returns on those investments is not one day affair. They will take time. But now when we start weighing against uh, the benefits, then cannot be a common man will take time to realize that, you know, the movement now from Mombasa to Nairobi has been shortened by, you know, almost 50 percent yes. of the time. The, you can now carry uh, 10 times the size of load that you used to carry before or even more. So in the long term, these benefits are going to pay and it's going to be, we are going to realize faster development, faster conductivity, mm -hmm. and make you know, the, the cost of doing business much cheaper. That's what we're looking at. So as we are impact on the fiscal consolidation exercise yes. and put measures and systems in place to ensure that there is discipline in whatever we undertake as government. So what we did is that we made sure that we try to see loopholes with our agencies charged the responsibility of collecting taxes. Mm -hmm. The KRA automating most of the border points through scanners by making sure that, you know, we substitute the fiscal interaction to a greater extent with, with the, you know, technology. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, uh, all the cases that has been, uh, uh, allegations that have been rampant in the, in the past yeah. can be managed. So number two, we also realized that in government, there are quite a number of expenditures that can be avoided or use substantially less amount of resources mm -hmm. to do the same task. Yes. And we looked at the areas of travel. There's been a lot of wastage. Mm. The idea of now sending delegations. And trainings. Trainings. Mm -hmm. Trainings, delegations, mm. 
to a greater extent has been a number has been a venue for to enrich or to give to still uh, for lack of better words mm -hmm. from the public offers it's not that these training are not necessary they are necessary but they can be made locally mm -hmm. Instead of like now when we are going for a delegation to those destinations, the size of our delegation has been worrying. Maybe even 10 times more or even 20 times more. A job and a delegation where five of them could have been equally effective. We sometimes send 100, we sometimes send 60. And, and you must realize that this is public money. Mm -hmm. And most of the time is hard and foreign currency. The yes. farmer was toiled so hard to send his produce to the European market. The foreign exchange, down, I, mean, I mean the foreign, uh, you know, the hard currency that we earn from there is what now we are giving to these public servants to go and spend abroad, where, you know, the stimulus, the net effect to the economy will be negative rather than stimulate, I mean supporting the local economy. So we are embarked on reduction of government expenditures identify targeted expenditure mm -hmm. to make sure that you know we live within the discipline. All right. Secondly, we also realized is that uh, in the past, there's been a lot of discipline the way we manage our pending bills. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's government, a very hot subject. Yes. yes. Government, uh, the MDAs, you know, the ministries mm -hmm. spend, procure goods and services from people, but the closure of the financial year, they are either not paid, and after that, then it becomes, you know, a, a different uh, scenario. Nobody wants to listen to you. Nobody wants to pay. Mm -hmm. And the person who's refusing to pay is not put to task as to why he has mm -hmm. mismanaged mm -hmm. public resources. So that has been our war. And uh, to a great extent, I'm very happy that, you know, is a war that we have uh, won 80%. Mm -hmm. Making sure that those pay, uh, pay, pending bills have been paid. Mm -hmm. So then over time, we also looked at the, uh, our debt uh, situations. Yes. The portfolio and the, the mix of our debts has been skewed. Over time, we have abandoned concessional borrowing and gone to commercial borrowing. Mm -hmm. While the concessional borrowing has more benefits, and now we have come in and uh, decided that this must be reversed, and we are actually reversing. We are now go accessing uh, concessional uh, you know, space mm -hmm. rather than going for the commercial. We have stopped boring commercially. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. So as we embarked on this, and the framework we presented, the estimate that we presented to the National Assembly yeah. was to reduce, to even have a less budget of less value mm -hmm. than the previous years. As we embarked on this, then now we are confronted with the challenge of COVID. And this has never been planned. And we have not put any systems or measures in place in advance to mitigate or cushion ourselves against the, the, the shock. So we had now gone to, we went back the drawing board sure. and made sure that, you know, we are now torn between pursuing the fiscal consolidation uh, exercise mm -hmm. or cushioning the economy, supporting our people. So we said now, we try to manage both. Yes. We don't overspend stay on course in the fiscal consolidation process but also make sure that you know we spend to support the lives and to support the economy so we looked at three critical areas number one that in addition to the medical uh, the health support that we give to the ministry yes we said we must now cushion the vulnerable segments within our mm -hmm. ministers that's why uh, we allocated uh, the president directive in the first stimulus package that we allocate additional 10 billion to support the very vulnerable, mainly within the urban centers, the informal settlements. Mm -hmm. These are people who on daily basis, now that they make, they go to, uh, every morning, they go to industrial area, they go to various estates in this country, yes. spend their time, you know, earn a living on daily basis. Maybe earn 500 shillings, 300 shillings, and the, by the time now they go back to their homes, they now support the Islam economy. They buy, you know, boga here, mm -hmm. they buy sugar, they yeah. buy these. And all these now also supporting uh, the economy in a way that, you know, there are people now who are on day-to-day -day basis are earning a living, yes. not only for that person, but also to the support of the local economy is going to, support, uh, is going to uh, make a difference. Number two, we also realize that those need 
to support business. Mm -hmm. At all level, the SMEs, our various industries, and mm -hmm. how, what did you look at it? We said, number one, we have to look at our, the fiscal, uh, you know, uh, space. Yes. And we say, let's give them tax concessions by reducing on the VAT from 16% to 14%. Mm -hmm. Reduce on the corporate tax from 30% to 25%. Reduce on income tax for all the employees and you know all the earners from 30 percent to 25 percent. But then overall, anyone within the tax bracket of zero to 24,000 per month is given you know uh, full uh, tax exemption. CS, do you believe this was uh, an effective strategy? Why not? Mm. Now the idea is that now you have more disposable income to your level that now you can spend. Yeah an extra shilling to sustain that industry, to sustain the farmer, but also acquire and you know, access more products uh, more at, at that level. Mm -hmm. So generally, you know, there could be as many arguments as possible, yeah. but in the long run, we might not see the result immediately. Mm -hmm. But uh, we think we are to cushion the industry. We are also not looking at just giving people handout, mm -hmm but also sustaining, you know, if those businesses collapses today, because of the shock, if they close all the industries, what will happen? First, it will take a lot of time for them to reopen. Or it to get be catastrophic for the economy. Yes, to get back on their feet, yes. it will take a lot of time. Number two, what happens to all those people who are working? They'll have lost jobs, they'll have lost income, mm -hmm. and now the other unintended consequence is going to set in, including security. Sure, the unemployment have, burden. I have food in my house, mm. but all my neighbors don't have. They can only stay for a short while. Yeah. Then now they become a problem to you. They will become a problem to everyone. Mm. Then now you will need more policemen. How do you continue supporting them? The generation of uh, you know taxes and revenue, we get our uh, revenue from those industries, from the sale and the production of those uh, products. But if those ones are now stalled, what will happen? So then ideally, then we also say, we asked Central Bank to look at you know, the, the, the monetary framework. And yes. that's how they came, came up with a reduction of the interest rates mm -hmm. and also the cash reserve ratio. So that now there'll be more money with the various commercial entities, commercial banks for online lending to the SMEs so that you know, at least the economy can remain alive. Uh, these are things that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. and. With the first intervention, we have also now come up with a second stimulus package where we are looking at broad areas to try to manage uh, the more productive labor force who have now either lost jobs or they are underemployed mm -hmm. by coming up with a program of Kazi Mutani within the informal settlements in all our urban centers. All right. Where now they'll be working, but they'll be engaging on public, fun uh, public you know, uh, undertakings like let's say clearing of drainages, working on the common facilities, mm -hmm. if they are, let's say, markets, if they are playing field, all this or now they're going to be a relook in terms of refurbishing them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is to occupy them and so that they can be earning uh, some money every single day where they are going to support themselves, their families, but they will also support the local economy. So quite a number of things that we are looking at. We are also now uh, supporting the farmers through by giving them uh, the e voucher so that they can continue uh, you know producing yeah additionally we looked at the sector of tourism where it is going to is one of the most affected if you look at the hotels if you look at you know airlines if you look at all these destinations have uh, more or less come to a halt and this is one of the top revenue earners for the government well might not be top but you know it's been uh, it's been doing very well yeah. but let me you know one good thing that Kenyan economy is quite diversified mm -hmm. and we are happy that uh, that diversity has supported the economy to remain afloat. If you look at uh, some countries uh, you know uh, in the in the ocean uh, let's say you know the now coastal lines mm -hmm. there are countries who are dependent on tourism up to 100 percent that's true or 90 percent mm -hmm. now what happens Meaning they have now come to a standstill. It's a full but shutdown. Yes, it's a full shutdown. What has sustained our economy mm. is that uh, tourism might have suffered, service sector travel has suffered, but we have a very vibrant 
uh, you know, agricultural sector, mm -hmm. and to some extent also uh, manufacturing. So all these now will, will give us uh, an opportunity uh, to be at least to stay above board. Right. If countries like, you know, let's say Nigeria or even Angola that are fully dependent on petroleum, mm. what happens now All revenue. with COVID mm. and now with a drastic uh, absolute reduction mm. of uh, petrol, so they are going to suffer more. But this country, we are also lucky because God has blessed us with plenty of rain this time. Last year and this year, we received rain above normal, uh, you know, above normal. Mm -hmm. And this is going to at least support the local economy, uh, at least for us to have to be fully, uh, uh, you know, to have full uh, food sufficiency, uh, which is going to help us uh, to greatly. So uh, if only now with this kind of challenge, supposing there was drought, it will have compounded our problem. So our economy is going to be resilient. Uh, the growth, our projection for growth of 6.5%, might not be realizable now. Mm -hmm. But we don't expect to go below 3%. Okay. If you look at the global average, they are talking of about negative 3%. Mm -hmm. So we hope to remain afloat. Uh, of course, main activity will be slowed down, but hopefully we are going to uh, rebound back and, 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 and stay on course of the fiscal consolidation, but also sustain the growth of our economy. All right. And uh, CS, uh, you've captured quite a number of items in, in those opening remarks. I'd like us to go into some more specifics, yeah. especially a summary of uh, the stimulus package in terms of uh, so far we know that the government has uh, plugged in about uh, $53.7 for the economic stimulus package. Yeah. I'd like you to just break this down for yeah. one inch yeah. to understand how will this money be spent yeah. and where are we getting the money in the first place? Just to remind you, the first set of stimulus package is what we did about two months ago. Sure. Where we looked at the enforced flow of payment or pending bill, VAT refund, the tax reductions. We cushioned the, the vulnerable by giving them 10, 10 billion shillings. We supported and facilitated the payment of the VAT refund. We reduced on a number of things and also made business much easier for the people. What happened at the central bank through reduction of uh, you know, the cash, cash base ratio yes. and the cash reserve ratio, all this was to support the economy to stay afloat. Mm. Number two, we've now come up with the second round of stimulus package. And we are not looking actually at uh, We've now made adjustment, yeah. but yesterday we are now looking at about 57 billion, mm -hmm. from 53 to 57 billion. And what are we looking at? We have eight thematic areas. Mm -hmm. Nine, nine was to, to continue supporting the vulnerable by additional trying to look at gaps if there are any people. You know, in supporting uh, the vulnerable segment in our, in our country, we are running a budget of 30 billion every year to look at the elderly, the severely disabled, the orphans. This has been an ongoing program. And giving credit to our, own, our president, by the time he, you know, he has some power, the number of beneficiaries was about 200,000, mm -hmm. getting a 6 billion. Mm -hmm. But that number now has grown to 1.3 million households with a budget of 30 billion every year. Yes. This is the, the regular one. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are, there are new form of vulnerable groups, mainly within the urban centers. People who have lost jobs, they have lost opportunities, and their families were in a very dire situation. And the targeting of this number are done between the State Department of Social Protection and Interior because they have a wider network. So we came up with a, a thematic area. Thematic area number one is to create employment opportunities mainly for the youth. Yes. And this is what we are calling Kazi Mutani. And through this, we've provided budget of 10 billion. They could be mainly in Nairobi, but they're going to take place in all the urban centers. And to the same extent, mm -hmm. we've appealed also to the, uh, the governors if they can replicate the same. As we now give them additional resources to manage their, you know, uh, 
county headquarters, because most of them are now urban centers, yes. they should also now run something on the side to now feed in into this program. Number two, we looked at the health sector. We said, what do we need to do in the health sector? There are a lot of interventions that are going on, but we said we need to create stimulus by enhancing consumption from the local economy. We have allocated some resources for the purchase of hostel beds to be scattered and spread across the country. Yes. And who's going to produce the beds? Our own Juakali people. Mm -hmm. Do they meet the standards? We are going to be very strict with the standards so that those ones that meet the, the international standard are the ones that are going to be recommended for direct purchases. Do we need to increase the number of personnel? To that effect, we have provision for employment of 5,000 health workers, but mainly at the lower level. Mm -hmm. The community health workers, the public health technicians, to support you know, the local communities, to create awareness, to educate them, you know, uh, reason to have you know, better hygiene, the washing of hands, and how to clean the environment. Yes. So the third area, we looked at the education sector. What do we need to do for the education sector? Mm -hmm. We said we came up with three areas. Number one, that what goes directly to the individual is going to have a direct impact on that individual, his family, and the economy. Mm -hmm. So we have now made provision to employ 10,000 teachers, new uh, in, uh, teachers for one year. And the unit of measure we are looking at uh, constituency, where on average maybe they're going to be about 30 or even more yeah. to be employed. Number two, we also looked at uh, infrastructure. Quite a number of infrastructure within the local uh, setup are quite are in their situations. Yeah. So we said we're going to now create more classrooms, have more classrooms to be constructed at the lower level. Number two, number three, we said there will also be need to support the local carpenters by purchasing uh, 250,000 desks to be scattered and you know, spread ac across the country. Mm -hmm. So with these, you see, if you now look at the carpenters who will be working on these, the people who will be working on the you know, construction of the infrastructure, and the people, the teachers who are going to be earning, meaning people are now going to work on this. The third area, we looked at the area of uh, water and environment. Mm -hmm. We said we can use this opportunity to create jobs for our people, but also safeguard our own environment. Yes. Planting of trees at the local level, at the institutional level, school levels, by protecting those you know, river basins, by making sure that uh, we support the rural economy, particularly in the assaults, by, making, by enabling them to ha get access to well-protected wells, yes. uh, you know, and pans, by, you know, by making sure that there is reconstruction, mm -hmm. but using local labor. If you have a well now, this well is protected, you know, you dug in the, you know, you uh, do it using hand, it's well protected, then water is up to people. So these are things that we are looking at. And additionally now, we, in the other area, we're also looking at uh, the road sector. What we say, we, we've made provision of five billion shillings yeah. for the road sector. And all these, uh, they are now going to be used of machines. All of them will be now constructed using labor. Hard labor. Yes, hard uh, labor. Mm. You know, people are going to work on it. If you have now a stretch of like a 10 kilometer within a specific locality, you, you say, okay, fine, we are going to split into about five contracts, but all labor. A number of people will be working between here for, for a number, for three months, and then the other ones like this, because the net sum of all this is that these people will be earning, will be supporting their families, will have achieved rural access roads, will have facilitated the flow of you know produce from the farmland mm -hmm. to the markets. Mm -hmm. So these are broadly the areas we're looking at. And then one important one is we're looking at the sector of tourism. Number one, our people, the local people at the various level, like if you go to like Kipia, Masai Mara, Narok, Kajad, and many other places. Yes. In addition to the international hotels, uh, the communities have also organized themselves to come up with ecologists community conservancies, mm -hmm. where they're employing people, they are protecting the wildlife, but they're also attracting tourism. Now all of a sudden these people have no income. And the number of people who have been employed, now they are going to lose jobs within no time. 
Yes. So what we did, we created a grant, 260 local conservers. You gave, we are going to give them a grant of one billion, but now targeted to cushioning employment, that they should not lay off those people. Yeah. We are actually now through the grant, and the grant is tied to the employees for one year. Additionally, we've also uh, asked KWS to embark on recruitment of 5,500 uh, sc scouts to support the KWS. This will be employment. Mm -hmm. now, we've also asked KTB through provision of you know, uh, marketing. We've given them a provision of one billion shilling to start now looking at the recovery process. We need for one year to embark on a recovery process and do it. Further, we've also created an, uh, a fund under the touring finance. We set aside three billion. This is just going to be seed money. Mm -hmm. To enable them now, as we come out of this, there will be need for rehabilitation of all those facilities, the hotel facilities, the renovation that needs to take place, the modernization that needs to take place. So we're giving them now that modest amount so they can borrow at concessional rates. They give them maybe 2%, 1%, or three percent, to so that they now embark on the repairs and rehabilitation of those facilities. Mm. So these are things that we are looking at. We also looked at uh, the flower sector. Has been one of a very strong inflow of the foreign exchange. Now our flowers now either this limited market, but now accessing those markets is actually reducing. So what we did is that we gave a provision of money about 1.5 billion to tie to the KQ that uh, we want to see how best we can subsidize the freight mm -hmm. that you now export to the European market. Yes. But to, to some component that government has made provision to cost share the cost of the freight. So these are a host of things that we are looking at. Subsidizing the farmer, you know, looking at the various areas that requires support uh, by making sure that you know we continue supporting, injecting money, cash into the economy, we will continue fighting, making sure that you know all the remaining amount of pending bills are settled, any claim for VAT are settled, in addition to all of these measures. So okay. these are things that we are looking at, and Quite together a... we are looking at about 57 billion, mm -hmm. uh, and that will be the second layer. But nothing will stop us also looking at another set of injection after another four or five months. All right. Mm -hmm. Quite a robust plan, CS, I must agree. And let me take it back to now the hot subject around the budget. We are staring at a budget of 2.91 trillion shillings and a budget deficit of about two, of, actually not a deficit, but how we plug to plug the deficit. We are looking to borrow 222.9 billion shillings our deficit, of course, turns at 4.9%. When you look at the current state of affairs, CS, a lot of economic pressures, like you've rightly put it, how will this impact on our budget as a country, considering the fact that you've already uh, implemented some tax measures that might deny the government uh, tax, tax, uh, tax income? Yeah. How do you intend to navigate through this and still finance the budget and, of course, tapping also into international partners? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Now, in the, in the budget making process, three critical areas need to be refocused under the current uh, situation. Yes. We have to look at are we generating enough revenue under the circumstances? Are we managing our expenditure based on the current reality? Then what do we do with our borrowing? I had actually explained this, so I don't want to go into the other two. Mm -hmm. Of course, the tax measures that we put in place, that we are foregone about 172 billion as mm -hmm. a result of the VAT reduction and also as a result of the uh, reduction of the income tax. Mm -hmm. So as a good economist, as somebody who must have a balanced uh, you know, economy, so the, the economy continues to grow. Yes. We have to look for now alternative. How do we now fill in this space? Yes. 
So we looked at this. They might not be popular, but they are unavoidable. Mm -hmm. We must be must have our own destiny under whatever conditions. We cannot have excuse that our economy is not doing well because we cannot continue blaming COVID. Mm. We have to come out of it and manage our own system. So what we've done, a subject that I'm sure is not going to be popular with the business community, Yes. over time, we have given so much in terms of tax expenditures. We have now people coming here to Treasury, going to Parliament, going to this, asking for tax exemptions, asking for zero rating of their products, mm -hmm. asking for, you know, a reduced taxation. People are now becoming opportunists. Yes. So, and over time, mm. those tax expenditures internationally, the standard average is about 2% of GDP. But Kenya has one of the highest tax expenditures in the world, at 6% of GDP, meaning of all the money we call it, we are now giving every year 6% of our GDP. And last year alone, we gave out 535 billion Kenya shilling in form of, these are tax for a gone, in form of zero rating. And you know the idea, international practice, is that you only zero rate, meaning you only zero rate, mm -hmm. you're actually compensating that person. Mm -hmm. You have to give the additional money and those ones are actually to support exports only. The international practice is only to support exports. But what have we done? We are now giving, we are now zero rating on finished products, the products that we are consuming ourselves here, which is completely negates the purpose of why, why it was zero rated. Number two, we have now different set of tax regime. You pay 16%, I pay 8%. The net effect of all this is going to cause imbalance mm -hmm. in the economy. There are some good reasons as to why to, we need to attract some form of investment. But now you know, you, bring, you ask you to bring your capital and we subsidize you for up to 150%. So what we did now is said, we should not over subsidize your, the value of your capital by more than you know the value of that capital itself. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we now get rid of, uh, we are proposing to get rid of 50% and reduce to, just say we subsidize we only give you tax solid up to the uh, the value of, of the pro of the capital, mm -hmm. and we propose this to be paid in three years. Mm -hmm. Fifty fifty percent. The first year we give you exemption. Uh, the second year twenty five percent. Third year twenty five percent. So that now it becomes hundred percent. So Out of are, this, uh, how how much do you intend to net? So, I, I told you, we've been giving out about a third, 30, close to 30% of our revenue yeah. as a result of this tax for a bond. So now we are now looking at it objectively. Some actually might take time to reverse, yes. but we want to reverse some of this. If I now give you example of uh, in the aviation sector, we heav heavily subsidize. Because we want to promote tourism, we said, okay, parts uh, on helicopters, uh, commercial planes, uh, we give them tax exemptions. But if you look at it, this, these are things that we can actually uh, do without. They are good because they support, but under this current circumstances, I'd rather give you, you know, reduce on the ta income tax, but also re return helicopters to the tax bracket. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we are doing. Okay. The full amount is about 535 billion, mm -hmm. but uh, we want to see if we can manage to reverse about half, like, like 150. Okay. So that now we can now see we are foregone 170 here, but through these measures we are able to recover, recoup uh, something to, to balance. All so right. these are things that we are looking at. So, CS, uh, still tied to my question on uh, the deficit in the budget. You've touched a, a number of measures that you are working on towards uh, boosting revenue collection. Um, Kenyans are worried about the tax path we've taken and, of course, the debt burden we have as a country. We are staring at a debt of about over 5.6 trillion. And at the end yeah. of it all, no country can develop without 
that at the same time you have to borrow judiciously mm. do you believe our borrowing has been properly informed by market fundamentals well foremost uh, I, and you correctly said i have no idea what is any country that has developed without borrowing if i now run you through the the frame i know the frame up, but you know uh, the debt position of countries that we refer to as developed will be will be surprised mm -hmm. japan one is our major uh, donors development partners in this process of supporting not only our budget mm -hmm. but also giving uh, supporting on a, a number of our de development mm -hmm. you know you know you know how what is their debt position they are borrowed 238 percent of the gdp mm -hmm. U.S. is 107 percent. Mm -hmm. U.K., Germany, all these developed countries. If you look at the neighbor, uh, Angola, with that rich, vast, uh, you know, natural Minerals. resource, yes, is 111 percent. Look at the ranking. Mm -hmm. And Kenya, death position is 57 percent of GDP. Mm. So we are even not, we are not even near there. All mm -hmm. these countries that have developed have all developed as a result of borrowing because we are not able to ra raise enough resources to undertake major infrastructure development. And I've told you earlier, they need some of these heavy investments, the benefits are going to be recouped in the long run and, and do it much better. It makes you know co cost of doing business much easier, cheaper, and make our life be much better. So, but for the last five, seven months, what we've done, we've now critically looked at our debt portfolio, our debt mix, and looked at, you know, how much constitute concessional borrowing from the multilateral market. By that, I'm referring to the World Bank, you know, all those multilateral My institutions. Yeah. And then secondly, how much uh, loan what is the component of the bilateral loans? And then we are now coming to the commercial. So we've now decided as a policy, first, we are lucky that we know, we have made sure that we put a debt policy in place, which was approved by cabinet uh, last month. Mm -hmm. So it's not about actually you, you just walking in and walking out with money. It's, it has to meet those necessary conditions and it has to be within the policy. We have also strengthened the Office of the Public Debt Management and equip them and facilitate them and give them powers that to undertake appropriate advice where even the cabinet secretary cannot just overrule them. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we put in place. But we've now what we've agreed is that we are going to borrow. Of course, our debt position is highly sustainable. Kenya has never defaulted on any pay, uh, you know, uh, payment of debt. Mm -hmm. And our debt position of GDP is quite reasonable by all international standards. As 57 percent, well, most of the other countries are over 80, sometimes even over 100 percent. It's something that, you know, uh, I'm not saying we're not worried about it, but we are also now looking at the future and seeing how best this can be maintained to a reasonable level, completely move away from commercial loans to multilateral. Because the multilaterals have a very good grace period, and long-term maturity, like even 30 years, and at very highly concessional interest rate, like 1%, 1.5%. 1 1 we might not feel it so much at once, but commercial loans are very restrictive. Mm -hmm. Commercial borrowing are quite restrictive. High interest rate of 8%, even up sometimes 10%, shorter repayment period, and sometimes even no grace period. So it's going to push a lot, put a lot of strain on the fiscal space. This is now what we actually now we have already agreed on how we are going to manage on this. And we did it out of one volition. And we also decided to engage the International uh, Monetary Institution, Monetary Fund, because we wanted to be make sure that we are now measured against international standard. Yes. We don't run our own course, but also within the framework of the international uh, you know, uh, regulation and standard to make sure that you know, our fiscal balance is uh, our fiscal framework is sound and acceptable, transparent, 
and above all in all we are doing. And that's, we are very happy because, like now, the last two weeks, we accessed international markets and we got about 200 billion Kenyan shillings. Mm -hmm. All of them concessional. 107 billion Kenyan shillings from World Bank at 1.5 percent, 10 year grace period, and 30, year, 30 years of repayment. IMF gave us equivalent of 78 billion Kenyan shillings, five and a half years of grace period, 10 year repayment period, zero interest rate. ADB, African Development Bank, we were able to uh, access 25 billion Kenyan shillings at more or less the same standard. Mm -hmm. You know, the net sum of all these, within our fiscal framework, we've already made a provision to borrow internationally close to 400 billion. Mm -hmm. And this was actually earlier on intended to be borrowed from the commercial market. Mm -hmm. So this new money is going to now substitute the expensive money. We are now going to now, uh, within our fiscal framework, we are now substituting the amount that we have borrowed from the commercial space mm -hmm. with new money, which is highly, highly concessional. So that is actually the direction we go. And they know you cannot access those markets, those concessional terms, if you, you are not on sound policy, if all your, you know, management or your fiscal, as a fiscal manager is not sound, you cannot access, not everybody can access. But the fact that World Bank and IMF have faith in what we've been undertaking for the last few months, it's, it's a vote of confidence mm -hmm. in the, the kind of direction we are going in managing the economy. Okay. CS, uh, we are now coming to the tail end of this interview and uh, still staying with the matter of debt. Uh, we recently raised our debt ceiling to nine trillion. Yeah. And uh, listening to what you've just said, don't you think this sort of um, places us as a country in a precarious position. On one hand, we are trying to do fiscal consolidation, uh, manage our debt better. On the other hand, we are looking at raising our ceiling. This, from my basic economics, sir, simply uh, tells us that um, as, as we grow our debt appetite, we're not only going to sink the country into more debt, but we're going to see a lot of debt repayments being channeled towards this. Yeah. I, 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 we, need to do, we need to differentiate mm -hmm. raising debt ceiling and actually borrowing. The reason as why we decided to increase our debt ceiling is just to give ourselves space. And those are targets. Mm -hmm. And that does not mean that, you know, we are going to reach that target in one year or even two years or even three years. We borrow using the fiscal framework. We borrow only on condition that parliament approves. And this is done through the budget. When we present budget to the National Assembly every year, we now propose to borrow some amount of money to support, I mean, to fill in our debt, uh, budget deficit or we borrow for certain uh, development undertaking. And then it's up to the parliament to reject or to approve. Mm -hmm. So our, 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 our projection is like, you know, the next seven years is when we, we think they are going to reach that level. But also don't forget that this is not a static economy. Mm -hmm. It's a growing economy. Our GDP keeps, uh, in keeps increasing. Yes. Therefore, uh, in the past, actually, we need to be, Kenyans need to understand is that we have simplified and made the message much clearer to the ordinary person. We used to say, okay, we are borrowing 50% of our GDP. How many, how many people on the street understand or even interpret what that means for themselves? But when we are saying now we are not going beyond 9 trillion, we are telling ourselves, Every year, we are now advancing towards the target. And therefore, uh, along the way, there are warnings. There are clear signals that we are closing there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to change. We need to change course. We need to reduce, you know. 
So even on the market, everybody knows what the, what the nine trillion means vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis, uh, what has been the situation. So that one actually is just a projection, and we wanted to move away from the moving target. When you talk of GDP, you know, debt to GDP uh, is a moving target. If the GDP increases, therefore your 50% can even be much more than what you're holding now. Yes. So we wanted to demystify this by making sure that we create a barrier, not a, you know, a moving barrier, mm -hmm. but a barrier of that, does, that, that does not move mm -hmm. beyond the target you have set for yourself. Okay. Yeah. All right. And CS, finally, as we wrap up, um, what's your message to Kenyans in terms of does the economy still remain resilient despite of what is currently happening? How soon are we likely to see economic activity getting back to full normalcy? And finally, what's your worst nightmare in terms of will we come out of this unscathed? Uh, what was my message to our people, Kenyans, is that uh, this is a pandemic like no other. At least not in our lifetime, not the one we have ever encountered. So the shock is not only against our economy, yeah. but it's against the world economy. Every country, every citizen, wherever they are, they are feeling it. What they feel in the U.S. is what we feel ourselves. The disruption of the supply chain, completely disruption of the trade patterns, the changes, you know, the, the interference with all the, you know, rational, you know, predictions that were made about, you know, sustaining the economy. That should actually give us comfort. But the solution lies with ourselves. The solution of coming out of this challenge lies with ourselves. Other countries can give support in terms of loan or whatever, but they are more concerned about their country than ourselves. So the measures that we put in place, the opening of the economy, will be dependent on how this, this uh, health challenge is going to unfold. If there's going to be more infections, if there's going to be more deaths, yeah. maybe we might not have a lot of space for doing business and, you know, continue with the life as normal. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be maybe further cons constraint, you know, of our day-to-day -day operations. But I'm optimistic that we'll come out of this stronger because Kenyans are known to be resilient. Kenyans are, no are known to be innovative. If you look at it now, we other forms of economy have taken place. The digital economy is becoming now replacing the day-to-day. -day. Now people can work from comfort of their homes yeah. and be as effective. If you like, if you know every morning or every day, we have meetings. We conduct meetings between cabinet, between ministries, even attending, participating in international conference, normally, but through virtual. The next sum of all these is that we have now made cost of doing business even much cheaper. Instead of sending a delegation of 100 people to overseas, Mm -hmm. We can actually be effectively participating in a meeting without necessarily spending a cent. Kenyans are now now turned to making their own masks, making their own PPPs, PPEs. And I think that's the spirit that we need to embrace. Mm -hmm. That we, each of us, play, uh, you know, undertake activities that's going to empower and make their lives and their families' lives differently, better, because the next term will be a better uh, economy for all of us. I am quite optimistic we are going to come out with this stronger, more resilient, but also with a better opportunity of saving on cost, particularly the government, to save on a cost on a number of things that we've been taking for granted. We can do it better, we can do it more efficiently, we can even do it cheaply. And the conduct of even, you know, the way we relate to each other the way we, more discipline is going to be enforced at all levels. Mm -hmm. And CS, I just want to get your parting shot as well. In relation to the budget and the uncertainty in the economy right now, what's your assurance? Because any time the government is unable to collect enough revenue, 
they read the same citizens and the fear is real in the minds of many Kenyans that brace for tougher times. I don't know, is this the position? The core of our business are the Kenyan people. For us to deliver services, for, la for us to sustain services, for us to continue providing uh, you know, quality services, we must invest in the social infrastructure. We must invest not only physical infrastructure, but also welfare of our people. But all this requires money. Where is going, government going to generate resources if they don't tax? Which government in the world have actually uh, developed without taxing its people? But we are doing within the international norms, we are doing within, you know, in the spirit and the interests of our people by making sure that we support the economy to grow for our people to feel better and also have deliver deliverance of so, those social goods uh, in a manner that's going to be appreciated. There are many things that we take for granted. Look at like now you sleep in your home, but there are policemen out there, there are policemen on the street. We have road, you have hospitals. How do we sustain you know the standards that we require if we don't generate enough resources. And the best general resources is the one we generate yourself. We say we only borrow as a last resort. That we want to invest in the future, making the lives of our people much better. But for day-to-day -day operations, we need to, taxation is, is necessary because uh, we must continue providing that social good. Okay. I am not saying that brace for tough times, I am saying that we, Kenyans, needs to be as understanding as required. All right. Because we have a duty to cushion our economy against this shock like no other. We have a duty to maintaining near normal uh, service delivery. We have expected to provide additional support so that we don't not generate into further challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, we've been speaking there to the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury, Ambassador Okuri Atani, giving us a broad-based interview in terms of how the country is performing and what the road ahead looks like. He remains optimistic that the economy will bounce back and Kenyans are a resilient people. For now, it is more of a wait and see, even as the government continues to navigate through these uncertain waters. Well, that has been this episode of The Trading Bell. We thank you for your time. Remember, you can always engage with us on our social media platforms appearing at the bottom end of the screen. And let's keep engaging. And of course, remember to keep safe, wash your hands, social distance, and above all, stay at home.